why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself um, and how you got into showing and starting to breed Siberian Huskies. My name is Jess. Uh, I live in Western Pennsylvania. Uh, I have three wonderful children and one handsome grandson who is the light of my life at this point. He's about three. Um, as far as my history with, you know, with showing and, and the dogs, I guess it started very early because my folks growing up raised um, and showed horses. And my mother dabbled a little bit in showing some dogs. My, her mother, my grandmother, um, raised Shelties and Collies. She didn't show. So, um, you know, but I was raised in that environment, if you will, or, or you know, kind of with that, that mind frame. And with Siberians, I had seen one in Lock Haven, Pennsylvania, when I had to have been in high school. And I, I remember it vividly. That dog had to have just stepped out of the groomer <laughs> and was standing in front of the library. It was a, a light red and white. And I drove past and just remembered thinking, God, what a beautiful dog. Someday I'm going to have one of those. And so someday came whenever um, my oldest daughter's pediatrician, uh, her husband had had a litter and I, I went out and, and got one. And I guess in my mind at that time, thinking that this dog was coming from a doctor, that it must be, you know, a, a good quality dog. And um, despite having some experience in the showing realm, I still was of the belief that a, a registered dog meant that it was, you know, it had to be a good quality dog. Um, but nonetheless, that was not the case. Um, he was a, a very good learning experience um, in in so far as what uh, what can happen if if you don't really do your homework and don't know what you're getting into. And at that point, I decided, you know what, if if I'm going to have litters or 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 breed dogs, I'm going to do it right. I'm I'm going to do it obviously to the best of my ability, but I'm, I'm going to truly learn about this. I'm going to show dogs. I'm going to go to seminars. I'm going to learn stuff online uh, when that became an option. <laughs> not, yeah. too long after, not too long after the, you know, in the covered wagon days back then. Um, so, you know, we're talking like, um, you know, 30 years ago. So um, yeah. And, and from there, uh, I, I do. I learn something new every day. That's that's the fun part about it. Um, right. What was no what was with the with your first dog that you the first Siberian that you had? What was it about um, him him or her that you realized that maybe they weren't from like let's say like a well bred breeder? Like you said, they were registered, but like you said, just because they were registered with with, with I'm assuming the AKC is what they were registered yes. with. What was right. it about that dog that made you think that maybe it wasn't from actually a well-bred breeder? So, you know, this is no stab at my daughter's pediatrician and, and the family. They had gotten some dogs and decided to have a litter. Um, but first and foremost, um, that the dog that we had had a, a very difficult temperament. Um, not that Siberians don't, but his was exceptionally uh up there. Mm -hmm. uh, and unbeknownst to me at the time, looking at his pedigree after the fact, you know, there were no titled dogs. Nothing was ever done with any of his ancestors except for breed them. Mm -hmm. um, and not knowing what the breed standard calls for in terms of appearance and um, I don't want to make it sound like it's all about the, the prettiness of the dog, but because there's functional things that come along with the breed standard, mm -hmm. but there were a lot of traits that this dog exhibited that put him more in line with being like a Malmute instead of a Siberian, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and so, you know, taken as a whole, uh, he was a, a great 
first learning dog <laughs> to, to be able to compare and contrast with, you know, what, what they, they should or shouldn't uh, be. He had, you know, a couple of minor health issues very early on, but health issues nonetheless, which, you know, not that you can't get health issues with a well-bred dog, but just, just enough stuff to make me go, Hmm. Okay. So, uh, clearly this is not a dog that if I'm going to do this right, I would want to be what a lot of folks refer to as a foundation. Right. So I know you'd said that you, you know, you kind of grew up with the showing and everything and you got your first Siberian. When did you kind of move into getting ones for, for breeding and for showing aside from your first one that you decided wasn't quite uh, breed or show worthy for you. Yeah. So the very next one that I got after that, I bought from somebody who had good, well, better lines, I should say. I mean, at least there was names in the pedigree to show where the dogs came from <laughs> and stuff like that. Um, but this was also the next step of education because um, that particular dog did not pass her eye exam. So this is another thing that you have to do if you're going to learn to be an ethical breeder, you have to do your health checks. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, for the longest time, it's always been hips and eyes in Siberians. Sometimes you're throwing in thyroid there. Um, and juvenile cataracts is, you know, the most common eye defect that you're going to potentially find in Siberians. Mm -hmm. And so we go once a year to a canine ophthalmologist, doggy eye vet, you know, cause you don't go to your primary care physician and say, Hey doc, I'm having trouble seeing you go to an eye specialist. It's the same thing in dogs. Yep. And, um, you know, and, and we breed clear to clear. Now we don't have a mode of inheritance yet for that particular issue. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't mean that just because dogs are clear generation upon generation upon generation that you might not still produce it. Mm -hmm. or have it crop up right but the likelihood is so much less than ones that were never taken in to to get their eyes checked in yeah. the first place i mean i would argue that definitely for hips hips they you know you go in when they're two you get the x-ray um and you get three vets that are trained to evaluate the hips into the socket uh and they're using little tools like micrometers to to look at everything and they will give it a rating of um excellent good fair poor or dysplastic mm -hmm. and the reason there are three is because let's say uh you know this vet says excellent and this one says good well then whatever the third one is is what they're going to give it you know what i mean yeah. like if it's good then it, that's where it's going to stand if it's excellent and so on so, um, you know, in breeds that are known to be predisposed to potential hip issues, it's usually recommended that you get those done. Mm -hmm. um, and every breed will give you a, uh, you know, the parent club, like the Siberian Husky Club of America, mm -hmm. you know, the, the whatever the group is for that particular breed will, will give you guidelines for what you're looking at. And so, you know, most will say you're not going to breed dogs that don't have a rating higher than fair. Mm -hmm. I myself have never had one that's um, not been good or excellent. And in the one example of a fair hip rating, it was done when the female was in season, in heat. Wow. And unbeknownst to me at that time, the hormones will actually cause joint laxity. I mean, if you think about it, the hips are, the hormones are expanding the pelvis. Right. And so I redid them after the heat cycle was done and mm -hmm. hers came back good the next wow. time. So it was interesting. That was, uh, again, another one of those cool learning experiences. Exactly. Um, <laughs> you know, learn something new every day. Uh, don't get your OFAs done when they're in heat. Yeah. Um, so, you know, if you really think about that, it's just seems like a lot of common sense. You know, mm -hmm. if you breed two dogs that have excellent hips together, mm -hmm. generation upon generation upon generation, the likelihood is that 
you're going to produce dogs with excellent hips. Mm -hmm. And if you breed dogs that are dysplastic or, you know, poor rating generation upon generation, the likelihood is that you're going to throw dogs with poorly constructed hips. Yeah. Now that does not mean that it's never going to happen. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Like there could just be some genetic anomaly in there somewhere, uh, you know, some sort of a, a thing that crops up, you know, no different than, um, so I have, uh, injured knees from, you know, from basketball when mm -hmm. I was younger and my brother had torn his knee in football and my dad had torn his knee in softball and, you know, so one can surmise that it's likely that we have some sort of a weakness or a predisposition mm -hmm. or would you say well it's just because they're playing sports i mean yeah you know, <laughs> no more or less likely than anybody else to pass i mean you know so that's that's the other issue that you have to look at when you're assessing data but nonetheless it, it just makes sense that you know, the likelihood would be diminished if you're checking for stuff. Mm -hmm. um, if you know the mode of inheritance for something that is identified with a genetic marker, then that's way easier. Right. So we did just in Siberians get some new genetic tests for shaking puppy syndrome and polyneuropathy. Uh -huh. And it's been identified fairly early on, which is really cool because that means that as long as we get the dogs tested and don't breed two carriers, you're good. And we don't need to eliminate the carriers because you will reduce your gene pool down so low that maybe something else becomes apparent or surfaces or, you know, you're, you're, you're limiting your genetic diversity in doing that. Yeah. And so as long as you just test and don't, don't breed two carriers, so in German shepherds and Australian shepherds, for example, they have a lot of markers. Mm -hmm. And so they'll test their dogs. And then when you see them announce a breeding, they'll say, you know, clear for DM and or carrier. And this one's, you know, clear for this and clear for that. So double clear and carrier for this, but this is a non-carrier and they yeah. list that all out you know, we're not to that degree in, in my breed yet, you know, just having very few, mm -hmm. but it's, it's, um, you know, it certainly makes it a lot easier to make informed decisions, you know, when you're considering a particular pairing. Right. Then with this being said though, like those, the markers that you're talking about for like the Siberians, whether it be the eyes, um, the puppy syndrome or, you know, hips into that, those aren't actually required though are they for no. like i mean for proper breeders or reputable breeders i would say yes but like you aren't actually quote unquote required to do those things are you yeah there's no law out there there's no uh u.s department of agriculture law that says before you breed dogs you must have hip and eye checks and do your dna on poly and shaking puppy mm -hmm. um and the AKC does not require that you submit those test results before you breed any dog. Yep. Um, now, most parent clubs, if you're going to be a member of the parent club, you're going to sign a code of ethics that says, I'm going to do my part to, you know, do hip and eye checks and so on and so forth. Uh -huh. And, you know, not accidents can sometimes happen you know, you get an accidental breeding on a dog that's, you know, 18 months instead of 24 months old when you do your hip x-rays. Yeah. So you could go get a prelim if you want. I'm going to be honest, you know, in Siberians, that is a lower incident rate kind of a thing. It's mm -hmm. almost more of a formality for the hips to be checked in good lines. Yeah. You know, we're 10 generation upon generation, but I'm never going to say don't do the checks because you don't know if you don't check, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, do your part to contribute to the database. But um, if that were to happen and I have that oopsie breeding on the 18 month old male, I'm just going to get his hips done at 24 months. I'm probably not going to go in and do the prelim. You know what I mean? Just 
for the sake of it because the likelihood of it being anything other than excellent or good is slim to none. Yeah. And by 18 months, I'm if there was a true major issue, I would be seeing clicking or movement issues something. or something like that. So mm-hmm. uh, I, I worry less about that. But the eyes I'm pretty hyper vigilant on because, um, you know, the good thing, if you will, about true Siberian cataracts is that um, a lot of times you, they're non-progressive and you're not going to even know unless you go check. Yeah. So uh, it is important that, you know, you do that if you're going to truly breed clear to clear. But we do not, to be clear, have the genetic marker. So, again, that's where I'm saying you can breed clear to clear for generations and still have a case crop up. Mm -hmm. And for hips, you can breed excellent, 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 good, good, good forever in a day. And all of a sudden you get some fluky, weird, fair dysplastic that crops up out of nowhere yeah. so but um that's with, you know that's but, with anything though like but if you're breeding yeah. you know excellent the likelihood of that is is so much lower than ones who never checked to begin right. with and they're you know let's say they bred two dogs that had just good or um and then it just you know can deteriorate slowly over the time the two um yeah and you can have things that show up that are not hereditary mm-hmm. you know i mean We did have one scenario with a family, uh, they were not ill-intended, but they missed the memo about uh, not using a dog for pulling sleds or weight of any kind until they're developmentally mature. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Siberians have a lot of energy. They thought they were doing the dog a favor, you know, getting them out, getting some exercise, pulling the kids around on sleds and stuff like that. Um, and actually did do some joint damage, mm-hmm. um, not hereditary. And, and again, they, they felt terrible. They did right by the dog. They did swimming therapy. They did, um, one, they did one corrective surgery. Um, and the, the prognosis on the dog turned out much, much better than what the thought was when it was first identified that there were mobility issues starting to crop up. Right. took a little while to figure out what was going on, but, yeah. um, you know, that's not a hereditary thing, you know, dog gets hit by a car, and has hip problems, right. <laughs> um, yeah. you know, you can have eye defects that show up because of an eye injury. Um, there's some research out there that suggests that, uh, there are some eye things that are dietarily influenced. Um, so corneal dystrophy, you know, if you're feeding high fat content food mm-hmm. for long periods and they get lipid deposits uh, on their corneas, then, you know, you can change the food and then it goes away. Right. It could just be a predisposition. You could call it hereditary, but in a lot of cases, that's just, you know, just a change. 